And even if there is a decade of 0% returns, over that longer time frame, that 40 years, it will return very strong results. Hey everyone, if you're new, well, I'm glad you found my channel. What I try to do here on my channel is explain that investing in the stock market is more than just buying a company you love and that's it and thinking it's gonna to go to the moon. There are a lot of people who are going to get crushed by this mentality and I'm trying to help you avoid it. The question I will be answering today is which ETF is the best? But this is a loaded question. What I mean is that first, we have to decide if an ETF is a good idea. Then secondly, if it is a good idea, which one is then the best? See, I'm going to try and give you a few options in this video and look at the argument from a few different angles. Then I'll give my opinion at the end and I think it is different from what you are expecting me to say. So the first thing I wanna share with you is a snippet from the greatest investor of all time giving his opinion on index funds. So this time I went back uh, actually to 1942 when I bought my first stock as an illustration of all the things that have happened since 1942. We've had, we've had uh, 14 presidents, seven Republicans, seven Democrats. We've had, we've had world wars, we had 9-11, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis. We have, a, we have all kinds of things. The best single thing you could have done on March 11th, 1942, when I bought my first stock, was just buy an index fund and, 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 and never look at a headline, never think about stocks anymore, just like you would do if you bought a farm. You just buy the farm and let the, let the tenant farmer run it for you. And I pointed out that if you'd put $10,000 in an index fund that reinvested dividends, and I paused for a moment to let the audience try and guess how much it amounted to. And it would come to $51 million now. So from 1942 to now, the easiest thing to invest in was clearly the S&P 500. 1942 to today is nearly 80 years ago. That's an incredibly long time. But a fantastic amount of wealth is created by just sticking your money into a low cost index fund and forgetting about it. But now I want to draw your attention to this chart put forward by Monish Pabrai. So what this is trying to show is that there are large periods of time where the market gets overvalued and these you don't get much return for a couple of decades. So if we look from right at the start at night in the 1900s for the first 20 years, 22 years, there was 0% growth in the S&P 500. And then it took off at 20, 21% per year for eight years. And then obviously got overvalued, it fell over. And then it took 25 years just to get back to that previous level in 1929 then 11 years at 9% 9, 9 per annum, and then it went 17 years with 0%, and then 15% per annum for 17 years, and then even from the tech crash in sort of 1999, 2000, to the GFC, that was 12 years of zero return for the S&P 500, and that's quite, a, that's quite a recent period of time. We've just become very accustomed since the GFC happened that it's, it's up near 15% per annum since then, and it's really taken off the last couple of years in particular. So like currently at 35,000, I'm, I'm not gonna speculate here, and I don't know what's gonna happen or when this is gonna happen, but there's, there's, it's likely based on this history that there's gonna be a period of time where we get very average returns in the S&P 500. There's gonna be a period where it's 0% for a long period of time, just because valuations have to match the, the actual underlying assets that are in this in the S&P 500. So now putting what Warren Buffett said a little earlier and then this chart from Monish Pabrai, I think the answer is all about your time frame. See, let's say you are under 40 years old and you enjoy your life and you don't wanna jump off a cliff. Well, you envisage yourself living for at least another 40 years. Well, the chart from Pabrai and Warren Buffett would both agree that an index fund is the easiest way to go. You will be very wealthy in your retirement and you will not have to rely on government pensions or anything like that in your old age. You will be totally looked after and probably the rest of your family as well. And even if there is a decade of 0% returns, over that longer time frame, that 40 years, it will return very strong results. If more people did this, governments wouldn't be so broke dishing out money to pensioners. So if that is your time frame, well, that leads us to the next logical question, which is which ETF is the best? And here is what Warren Buffett says about that. Yeah, I would say that in terms of the index fund, I would I would just take a very broad index. I, I would I would take the S and P 500 as long as I wasn't putting all my money in at one time. If I were going to put money into a index fund in relatively equal amounts over a 
20 or 30 year period, I would pick it. I would I would pick a fund. And I know Vanguard has very low costs. I'm sure there are a whole bunch of others that do. I just haven't looked at the field. So to be as specific as possible, the best ETFs to buy must be diversified and have the lowest fees. So I've done some digging and here are the best three. The first two here are American based companies, but most of these companies have worldwide exposure. If you would prefer to not focus as heavily on America, then VT is a total world ETF with the biggest companies from all over the world. This one gives you less America risk, but the fees are a little higher. You can access all of these through your brokerage account. Now I use Interactive Brokers and Saxo Bank as my brokerage accounts. I have links in the description to them both. And I do have a video explaining a little more advanced tax strategy for index funds investing in the same ETFs as I just showed you, but through Ireland. Watch my video on that topic if you're interested in saving even a little more over the long term. It isn't for everyone because it depends on your tax country. Now, when you go researching into ETFs, there are a range of different ones. See, there's emerging markets only ones, biotech ETFs, small cap ETFs, anything you can think of. All have significantly higher fees and generally don't perform as well over a long period of time. So just keep it broad and most importantly, keep the fees super low. They don't get any lower than the three that I mentioned in the table earlier. Okay, now let's hear an alternative provided by Charlie Munger about index funds. Well, sure. Well, I personally prefer holding Berkshire to holding the market. So because I'm quite comfortable holding Berkshire. I, I think our businesses are better than the average in the market. So I think it's really interesting to hear Charlie Munger saying that he prefers to have Berkshire Hathaway because their businesses he thinks are better than the average business in the market. And I think this is a really interesting point. If you understand Berkshire Hathaway, you might agree with Charlie and think that Berkshire has better businesses than the average, so it should perform better than the average. But owning Berkshire over the index is inherently more risky because something dramatic might happen to Berkshire Hathaway. Maybe the new people running the business after Charlie and Warren could theoretically run it into the ground. The index is superior in this way because if one company falls apart, it just drops out of the index and is replaced and you don't have to ever think. So even though Charlie said that, here is what Warren Buffett's comeback is to what Charlie said. I do, I do not think uh, the average person can pick stocks. We happen to have a large group of people that didn't pick stocks, but they picked Charlie and me to manage money for him 50 or 60 years ago. And, and uh, uh, so we have a very unusual group of shareholders, I think, who look at Berkshire as a lifetime savings vehicle and uh, one they don't have to think about and uh, uh, one that they'll, look, you know, if they don't look at it again for 10 or 20 years, that, that uh, will have taken care of the money reasonably well. But that, I wouldn't argue that the S&P 500 over time, I would, I, I, perfect. I, I like Berkshire, but I, uh, uh, I, I think that the a person who doesn't know anything about stocks uh, at all and doesn't have any special feelings about Berkshire, I think they ought, to, they ought to buy the S&P 500 index. Essentially, Buffett is saying that unless you understand Berkshire Hathaway and have a special feeling towards it, just buy the index. So what do you think? I think that if you don't mind learning about Berkshire, and if you don't mind keeping an eye on it into the future, then I think Berkshire is a great option. Maybe you don't have 40 years to enjoy the benefits of the index fund. I think Berkshire is a great option to outperform in a flat market. If my time horizon was 10 to 15 years, then I think this is a good option. But you will need to put in more work to keep up to date with Berkshire. Things can change, which is the negative of owning individual companies. So there you have it. The best index funds are VOO, IVV, and VT because of the broad diversification and the low fees. Don't get fancy with alternative ETFs. Invest in these ETFs consistently over a long period of time and all will be fine. And if you are willing to do a little more research, take a good look at Berkshire Hathaway as an alternative option. Now, if you do actually get any value out of this video, make sure to hit the like button for me so I can get some feedback and I'll see you in the next video.